Howdy! Welcome again to another part of Life Science Mentors 180 Day Idea Machine Challenge. We are now at day 38, I think, and um, today's topic is card games. 10 ideas for card games. And freely invented, invented. I came up with 10 ideas, some of which were adapted from existing, uh, from existing board games, some of which I believe my complete own creations, um, and I try to put some, I try to put some ideas on there, how you can execute them, what the rules are, and so on, and so forth. So, first of all, I thought of something that I would call, how did I call it? Um, I would call it <laughs> card puzzle. So essentially, instead of putting a jigsaw puzzle together on the table alone, why not do that in a group and be open to any outcome? So the cards will have different patterns on them, right? So for example, this is a very schematic draw drawing. You have a card like this, and you can have a card like that, right? And you see that they that they fit on on some ends like this, but they won't fit on some ends. And one rule is right there: never play it in front of a mirror because you totally don't know which your. Geez, if I move this move this to the left, it moves to the right on the screen. Interesting. I think the Macintosh built-in camera turns around the sides. But I digest here. This doesn't this doesn't fit. Um, this fits, right? And so what each player could do. So each player has like ten of these in his hand. Takes them from a pile of cards. The pile is covered, right? It's like face down. And so everyone has these ten cards, and he starts putting these patterns on the table like this, right? So I put this on on the table, and then somebody else can look at his cards and maybe has a different pattern with which he can then replace one of your cards. And you have to take the card back. The goal is to be rid of all the cards you have in your hands. Um, now, how do you avoid that I just replace the other player's card, did I just re-replace the card that was just replaced, right? So, to be clear, I put out two cards, my neighbor changes one of the cards to give that back to me, and now what prevents me of whipping out another card and putting that down, and so he has to pick up his card back, right? So, like a back and forth of cards. Um, for that reason, I would have, like, some values uh, assigned to each card. So basically you can only replace something with a higher value or with a lower value with a specific symbol. You could you could do that, right? And then on the long run you would have a big big pattern of puzzles, of puzzle pieces emerge on the table because everyone will will um will add will either replace his card, replace one of my cards that I have to pick it back up, or he puts his card uh, neighboring to one of the cards, one of the par pairs that's already laying there, right? So, now over time, a big picture of different puzzle parts emerges with different patterns strewn all about, and you can still change that. Um, you can still turn around um, some cards, replace them with your own cards, and then disrupt patterns. But you can only do that when those cards are at the edge, right? You can only do that maneuver where you place one card with, with another. Um, you can only do that as at the edge of the whole pattern, right? So if you know what your neighbor has on his card, on, on his hand, and you kind of infer that from, from knowing which cards he placed down, so if you know that, then you can basically make sure that your pattern, let's say this, uh, let's say this is buried inside the uh, inside the puzzle, so that the other person doesn't have a chance anymore to place to 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 get rid of his card and place that on. Um, in which case, he would have to pick up a new card from the pile, um, and so on and so forth. So right. So in the end, you will you will able to facilitate you losing your cards 
and integrate them into the puzzle that emerges. And the other players will just pick up more cards. Because they can't, they basically, basically you try to get rid of your cards that are well fitting. And your neighbors, your opponents, will lose when they accumulate all the non-fitting cards. And I thought that makes for an interesting, interesting dynamic. First of all, you have a pattern that emerges on the table, right? And then you also, you also have, have to watch out who put which card down, who could have uh, certain cards in his hand, who probably doesn't have certain other cards. Um, and so it, re it requires you to think on the spot. And you can also build alliances, right? You can have like, you can be together, you can, you can, you can form a team with one, with one, play, with one or two players and then you, you make decisions, exchange cards, place new cards at the edges of the emerging pattern that benefit you and your group, right? Or you can actually act against another player openly and try to, try to get him really the bad cards that he can't put down on the table. And so I think that would be a very great, very great, uh, very great uh, entertaining game. Once again, two different things are important here. One is that you place down your cards and lose them. So the so you try to try to integrate the well fitting card and make build the pattern in a way so that's beneficial for you, and you can fit your own cards in. And the players who lose will be the one who have to retain all the cards that they can't anymore fit into the puzzle, right? And then the second part is, it's, <clears throat> it's uh, interesting patterns emerge on the, on, the, um, on the whole table, like an overall pattern. Imagine that these here, for example, these puzzles would make like pretty interesting labyrinth over time, right? You could also do something, envision something different. Imagine like people's heads where there's like um, a nose that fits with another nose or a hair color that fits to another hair color. You can, yeah, you can make uh, make patterns fit with colors. You, you know, you can you can have different patterns on one card, but the same color. And then the rule is that you can put those, match those cards and place the cards next to each other and integrate them into the overall pattern that have the uh, matching color and, and stuff like that. You know, how you do the pattern on the cards, this is just a simple illustration. But how you do that can be very elaborate, can be also very simple. The point is that you have a game where you have to think about um, integrating small graphic parts into a bigger pattern. That would be number one, card puzzle. The second one is inspired by a movie, by, by a TV show called The Wazzles. And I was only aware, made aware of it like a couple, couple weeks ago, basically. It was an 80s show, basically. Wazzles. W-A-Z-Z-L-E. Those were creatures where you had like a lion and a bee fused together. So you had like a lion with like bee um, antenna or something like that. I think you can you can look it up on YouTube. It's, it's kind of kind of funny. And um, I call this game Wazzle Up. So what you do is um, everyone gets 10 random cards and the first person once again to lose them all wins. Um, so you take two cards from your hand that could go together and place them on the table and you call that care that pair a wessel or you can call it a castle from wesseling cards and wessel okay so now the next person can do the same with two cards of his or he can decide to one up you he can replace one of your two cards with his own so you would have to pick up your card again and like i had in the first like i had in the first game um, here it's actually more important even you would um, you would basically have um, you have numbers on each card, right? So it's called wazzle up. So I can place, let's say, my neighbor puts a line and a B card together, right? So, but then I decide that really um, a wolf could replace the line, right? And then I can do that. I can replace the lion with a wolf because the wolf has maybe a higher value on my cards, right? Um, so I wazzle that up. But I cannot replace the lion with a sheep because the sheep has a lower value than the lion, right? And that way you can avoid that, that you get like a constant like exchange back and forth of cards. 
And so, yeah, your goal is to just get rid of all the cards on your hand and um, to um, make sure that the other persons pick up have to pick up back the cards that you can get you get rid of your cards and the other person has to pick up their cards and start thinking of a new way to put them down, right? You can also make like, make like um, introduce uh, additional ideas like trestle. You could fit three cards together or a lightning round where you put your card into an existing vessel and the next person in clockwise direction gets the card that was replaced and now it's 30 seconds to get rid of it on another vessel. So that basically, um, sorry about that. That basically, uh, that basically would be um, the game. When you pay attention. You know what cards your neighbor has, so you can decide if you want to help him or sabotage him. You know, the card who keeps the last card without being able to put it down loses. Wazzle up. Number three, port of calls. There's a, this is an economic game, game of economy. So when I was young, I played a computer game with the same name. And basically, you had to build up a business empire by shipping things via, yeah, via ships um, over the world, right? So you were agreeing to, to, um, to ship like um, fruit to Karachi. Or, and then you, you, you get some money for that. Right, and if if you're you get more money if your goods come or arrive on time and so on and so forth. Right, so you could do that as a card game as well. So there's like maybe like four different types of cards. Right, one is ships, one is um, harbors, then there's money, and then there's orders. So you want to have the most money after fixed amount of rounds, and if you're taking financial hits, eventually you'll have to sell your ships and then people will drop out of contention. So how you earn money is like you place a ship card on a harbor card and then you pick up another card that signifies the goods. And then you transport those goods from harbor A to harbor B. Put your ship card on a different harbor card. And... Um, at the beginning, all these ships and harbors and goods and money cards, they're all covered, face down, and everyone has 10 cards. You start, somebody starts putting them, putting the first harbor up, putting the first ship up, and then over time, you, you get to place more, more harbor cards up so that more possibilities open up, right? And then at the beginning, so basically, you have to pay money for being able to use a harbor, but then you also get money for being, for agreeing to ship some goods, right? So you have to make a balance be be between paying money and then receiving money, basically investing money via paying money for harbor and getting that money back. And so there may be different strategies, right? So maybe at the beginning you um, you use like very small unknown harbors, don't make much of a profit, but also don't have much of a loss. And then, you know, you buy more ships when you have more cards, you can take on the bigger harbors that give you that give you bigger money and so on and so forth. So basically, with cards, your business empire grows and grows. Port of calls. Number four, I call it story time. So here the goal is to build a story towards a predetermined finish. So the cards have different symbols on them, like like a man, an apple, a house, and so on. So you place one card down each round and take a new one from the pile. And you can't just place any card down. You have to build a storyline around it, right? So everyone has his own storyline. But now comes, you can actually cross storyline, right? So one person has a certain storyline built up and you realize the next card you have actually fits not more nicely into somebody else's storyline or your storyline that grows, right? If you use one card, you can bridge the last part of your story with a middle part of somebody else's story, right? Let's say I have a crime story and, um, and so my police officer wants to arrive at the scene, right? And now somebody else 
has the story about how he builds up his bicycle, uh, his bicycle shop, right? So then I could bridge it by um, by saying that you know my police officer, I put like a and I have a like say my last card is the police officer, and I constructed my story that the police officer is now on the way to the crime scene, and my neighbor's last card is my neighbor's story is somebody. Builds, is, is about his bicycle shop and the last card is a new bicycle that he got in that shop. So, and I have a card with money on there, right? So what I could do now is I can place the money between the police officer and the bicycle in that shop. And then I can say, to get to the, to get to the crime scene, my police officer takes his money and buys a bicycle from my neighbor's shop. And you see how that works? So then you can combine different storylines. And I think that would really be a fun exercise. It's actually a game you could you could you could do yourself at home. You can you can take like you can cut like a cardboard into pieces and draw different symbols on it, like apple, police officer, firefighter, car, um, house, whatever, and then like some oranges, whatever comes to your mind. Normal normal things. And then and then people construct their story out of that. And I think there's a natural dynamic that would develop. It would make, it's, not a, it's not a game where somebody wins. I mean, formally you have to get rid of all your cards, but I think the bigger fun comes from all the stories that, that, that evolve. And then maybe there's some inconsistencies, right? Maybe before I can place the money card, um, there is somebody else who places a robber card to that, to that bicycle store. So now the bicycle store story is that the, that the store gets robbed. And I have money, but I can't buy a bicycle in that store anymore. Right? So, but maybe then, but maybe then the story evolves in a different way. So, and then it turns out that the guy who robbed the bicycle store also robbed the first store in the crime scene. You know, there's so many different combinations. It's kind of exciting to think about it. Story time. That would be a game. Number five would be a mix between Scrabble and Solitaire. It's really simple. I don't think it exists yet. So you know solitaire, right? You have to have like you have to like there's a king, a queen, and then a, and there's a peasant, and then a ten, nine, eight, seven, and you have to you have to put like uh you have to put these um put like fitting cards. You have like a black uh the ace of the ace this uh, this seven of spades. You can add that to the eight of hearts, right? Depending on on all the eight of spades, depending on which version of solitaire you're playing. I mean, we all know this game, right? From like I think those were the first one of the first computer games, games that you basically could play on the computer screen where you had like you know just to, to kill time. And now, what about you? This you replace the symbol cards with letters of the alphabet, right? And then instead of putting a pattern, you have to build words. So I think that's a that would be a nice a nice variation. It's nothing big, but it's a variation of the solitaire theme and. Sometimes, sometimes the most popular games are just variations of existing games, right? It's very simple. Um, number six would be minimize. The question is, do you really need all of your cards? So you start with ten cards and place one card before you, next round two cards, then three cards and so on. And the cards are different symbols. Somebody has a matching card, you will pair the card with yours, and then you have to pick it back up. So you're consistently taking up cards and trying to lose them, and you have to place your cards uh, strategically, so you, so you can choose which card you want to put down. And um, you can put them either on your pile or on somebody else's pile. So um, the goal is that you want to come up with a series that no one else can match, right? So you want to have a series of cards that nobody else, and you know over time who, who has which cards, right? And then you can try to place a, place a card plays a row of cards that nobody can pair it with anything, you don't then that means you don't pick up the cards and you get rid of all your ten cards. Number seven, I call it an investor's game. So everyone has to build up a large amount of money or karma for valuable services for the other players. So like every round, you know these service cards or event cards for Monopoly? Those would be service cards. So every round a player can pick up money or a service card. And 
then he plays a service card, or he, he basically plays his card, he may lose a lot of money, but he gets a lot of karma points from the other player. So, um, if you give a lot of money, you get a lot of value back, but you also make someone else very rich, right? So you basically exchange money for karma points, right? Money cards, event cards. And, you know, you have to find the right balance between, um, through helping someone else, right? So you have service cards, tell you you have to pay $200 for someone's birthday. So you give the $200 to somebody else, and he gives you karma points back for that. You know, and, um, and then, um, and then you have a balance between, between, yeah, somebody become, some people become rich in, in money, others become rich in karma. That would be number seven. Number eight, battleships. So this is an adaptation of the board game version, right? So you have two different kinds of cards, missiles or torpedoes and ship cards. And then all, all cards represent positions on a grid, like B4, C3. So if you have like a, and, and the goal is to build a fleet out of one battle cruiser or battleship. There would be four cards, four positions in a row. Um, uh, like three, um, uh, two, three element ships, two cruisers, four two element ships, four submarines. And yeah, and, and that will be the end of the game if you have built that up. So every player gets 18 ship and 18 missile cards to begin with, and the remaining cards stay on a pile. So now you play a missile card each round. And for example, you can determine where you want to play it. Right? And then you say B3, and then somebody else has a three element ship with B2, B3, B4. My cruiser, who's on B2 to B4, is done because you just hit it, B3. So I got to pick up three new cards. Then I have to somehow, mi somehow mix and match into a ship, right? And then I try to avoid uh, the impact from the other player, the missiles, and, you know, build up my fleet. Number nine, memory. But, you know, you know memory, right? So you have a big pile of cards spread on the table and each, there's lots of pairs, and they are all, of course, in different positions, right? Um, what if you, instead of doing that on the table, have cards in your hand? So you try, you have 10 cards in your hand, you try to get rid of them through building pairs, right? Um, so at the beginning, everyone shows their cards for 10 seconds and covers them. And let's say I have an apple card, and now I remember where's the other card in the beginning, right? So I can say, you know, I'll like to pair that with your Apple card. Boom, done. I can el elim eliminate my card and the other person's card, right? The other person now has to pick up a fresh card. So while I have nine cards, he has ten cards. He, again, he shows the card briefly, and then he can determine who has the second card, and so on. The, 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 in the beginning, it's easy to remember who had which card, right? And progressively, um, it depends more and more on your memory, memory capacities. Um, you know, the person with the best memory in the end prevails. And then number 10, I call Secret Action Santa. So it's Christmas time and we all know this nasty Santa or Secret Santa. You know the game where you put, uh, where everyone brings a gift and wraps it up. And then it's determined, like a group of 20, each one draws a number from one to, from one to 20. And so, let's say you have, you have number one, right? Number one takes presents from the pile, opens it, and then is maybe a, a is maybe a Blackwood Forest, or maybe a, like a miniature of a German cuckoo clock. Um, and then, okay, the next person opens up, uh, can either decide if that person wants the miniature cuckoo clock, or wants to pick up another another gift from the pile. And maybe then he has uh, a Starbucks gift card. Right now, person number three can decide 
do I want the cuckoo clock or the Starbucks gift card or pick up another gift from the pile, which could be another cuckoo clock or maybe um, even like an actual CD better than the Starbucks gift card, something like that, right? Um, so it follows that the person who is last is in the best position because that person can choose from anything out there because everyone else has uncovered their presence. So with the cards, it would work like this. You want to have the most valuable card at the end, right? So the first player takes the card from the pile, places it in front of him, visible. Now the second player can decide to take that card, only one from the pile. And if he takes the card of another player, like that card, then the first player can choose a new one from the pile, and so on and so forth. And the one with the, with the, who has the card with the biggest value actually wins. However, uh, like that would only be, like, if you play like that, then the person who has, uh, who is really last will automatically win because that person will automatically get the card with the highest value, right? If the same with the gifts, um, and, but with the gifts, highest value is subjective, right? So if the first person has uh, a Starbucks gift card, maybe I don't like Starbucks, right? So that is not valuable for me. But if we only draw, draw cards that have a certain, have always the same value on them because we reuse them every time, then yeah, value is pretty absolute. So everyone can agree that the, that the card with the number 100 is probably the most valuable card. So last person will automatically win. However, that's why we put a little bit of a, of a, a little bit of a, a little bit of a, of a handicap in there. Every player who gives this card away right? Whereas if I choose players one, player one card, so player one can now determine that I have to carry out an action. It could be like walking barefoot in the snow or singing the Christmas carol or, or anything that comes to mind. So in the end, it's a fun collaborative game because, you know, probably still the person will still, the person who's last will probably still get the best card, but who knows? I mean, um, if you have to actually perform something before taking somebody else's card, not sure if the last person really wants to perform like one of the biggest stunt that he's required. So maybe he rather holds on, um, he rather uh, holds on before singing. Maybe he sticks to his card and decides not to sing the Christmas carol, right? So um, those are just some ideas. And I think, uh, that would make for some interesting Christmas experience and Christmas conversation, right? So that's that's number 10. Number one, let's recap them quickly. Number one, card puzzle, where you get to uh, match different patterns and place like new cards on existing cards. Number two, wazzle up, where you change, where you, where you have to uh, place different figures that go together. Um, Number three, port of court. We have to build up a ship empire, ship, ship, shipment, shipping business empire. Um, story time. We have to build a story out of cards that you got. Um, then the mix between Scrabble and Solitaire. Um, minimize, where you have to minimize the number of cards. Where if you get rid of your cards, um, but you can actually add to other people's cards, make them pick up cards that match with other cards again. So it's a back and forth. Um, the investor's game, where you have to come to a good compromise between giving money and receiving karma. Um, battleships, which is the card version of the tabletop game. Um, memory, card version of the tabletop game. And secret action center, playing secret center or nasty center with cards. Those are my 10 ideas and um, let me know if you have any more. Thank you very much for your interest and visiting. And if you enjoyed this video, click like. And um, so far, I hope you had a nice day. I see you again tomorrow. Uh, leave me a comment if you like. I answer every comment. And that's that so far. Enjoy your night and see you on the other side tomorrow again. Bye. Oh, and if you, as I said, if you enjoyed this video, click on like. 
And if you want to see or to be notified of new videos coming out, subscribe. Um, and hit the subscribe button. And uh, I wish you a nice, I wish you a nice evening.